doing here today, folks. So, um, yeah, in the last year I've been working with a great team of folks uh, from Lullabot and the state of Georgia, and we've been working to help them move their sites to Drupal 8, and I've been helping to lead the front end team on the work that's been involved with that. And so I'm going to talk about that work here today. So, I'm Mark. Uh, this is my wife, Rita, and my daughter, Izzy. I've never been to DC before, except until this last month when I came for the first time uh, with my family, and we had a really wonderful visit to Washington, DC. And now I'm back here to talk to you all, which I'm super excited about. Uh, I've been at Lullabot for the last five years. I'm a senior front-end developer there. Help to make websites look great and work well. I really care about front-end performance and accessibility. And uh, before that, I worked for uh, local government for 10 years. I worked for the city of Minnetonka, a, a suburb of the Twin Cities, and for a decade. And I also was a part of a board of the National Association of Government Web Professionals, which is an organization that helps connect people working in government to each other. And they put it on a conference each year. I was on the board for that organization. And so great group of people, NAGW.org, if you want to learn more. And so I'm really excited to get to work with a government organization again and to help people out. Uh, in my copious spare time, I also have been working with the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Group for the last couple of years. I'm on the leadership team there, and we're helping to make the Drupal community a more diverse and in inclusive space. Uh, I've, in particularly this last year, I've been working on a uh, speaker diversity initiative. And the culmination of that, we raised a bunch of money, and we're going to have an online speaker diversity workshop September 21st and 28th with uh, Jill Binder, who's been leading these workshops in the WordPress community. She was helping me last night with my talk here. She's amazing. You should sign up for the workshop at dribblediversity.com. It's going to be awesome. Uh, there's, everybody has something that they can share, and I'd love for you to be able to do that too. So please sign up. Anyhow, what I'm here to talk to you about today is our work on georgia.gov. Uh, they have... 85 plus websites. That's a lot of websites. Uh, and so uh, they wanted to have a new, much improved design for those websites. They wanted to move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. So there's a lot of complicated things involved with that. And I'm not going to start out by talking about that. I'm going to talk to you about something else. And that is the residence in Marriott in Bethesda, Maryland, right. which I stayed at. Um, and it's a really nice hotel. I'm glad to be staying there. I found this art on the wall. It's very pretty. It's very lovely. Uh, there's also a lot of construction right next door to the hotel. And it is very loud. And it woke me up Monday morning. And I couldn't sleep when I was trying to. And so I told the hotel staff. And they, they were very kind enough to move me to another room that would be quieter. And so I got to that room, and it looked really nice. I mean, I'm really thankful to be in a nice room. There's like a suite, there's like a living room, and there's like a kitchen, and, and it looks wonderful. It is really nice to be in a nice looking room. And it's great to have a kitchen, that's really cool. And so I went to open the fridge, and, and that's, that's the thing you do, right? You go into the kitchen, you open the fridge, and I didn't know that fridges can be backwards. <laughs> But they can. Like, you probably never thought about this, but you stand in the kitchen and you open the fridge so you can stand in the kitchen and use the fridge. But this fridge didn't work like that. You can't, you have to stand outside the kitchen to use the fridge. You have to stand in the, like, lobby to use the kitchen. That's not how fridges usually work. So that was interesting. And then, like, so there's a living room and then there's, like, a hallway to the bedroom and then there's like a bathroom off of that hallway and I found that there's like a door that connects the hallway and the living room and and you have to either choose if you want to be able to go to the living room or the bathroom. Choose wisely. You cannot do both at the same time. They, they, they just decided you have to pick which made like unpacking interesting. And then like I found this button in the bathroom I don't know what it does, and they surely don't either. And I didn't want to press it because I was pretty sure I was going to get electrocuted. So 
the point of this is, it was a really lovely hotel, and it's a great hotel, and I'm very thankful to stay there, but they really needed to consult with somebody, like the equivalent of a front-end developer for hotel rooms, to talk through how this hotel room was going to work, because it didn't work very well. And I really love this quote from Steve Jobs, uh, that I'm not going to read the whole thing out loud, but it's that design, people think, you know, hey, design is things that look great, but it's not just that. And I think this is why a lot of people like Apple products, because it's how it actually works. It's how it works. And that hotel room, it was, you know, I like it, but it, it doesn't necessarily work well. And the same thing is true about front-end development. Front-end development is not just about, hey, we've got a design, make it make it happen in the web browser, make our website look nice. It's about how do you make the website actually work and function really well. And when front-end development is done right, front-end development can solve real business problems that an organization has. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about with Georgia. Not just how we made the websites look nice, but how that solved real business problems that Georgia had. And mind you, you know, we use some newer front end techniques, and I'm gonna tell you about those. We use some, uh, some, some awesome stuff, and awesome stuff doesn't always mean awesome JavaScript things, it's awesome CSS things too. And, but those were in service of addressing organizational needs, and we were able to still do that, do really cool things while preserving background backwards compatibility so that it worked in older browsers, IE11. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. This is not a how-to talk about how to do that, but I want to kind of give you an overview about how we solved problems on Georgia. And the real important thing that I want you to take away from this is that conversation is what's really important, is getting front-end developers in the room with your business stakeholders to talk through what the problems are that you're trying to solve with your website because we really do have some good understandings that can help to solve real problems for organizations. So, we did a lot of things on Georgia. I'm going to talk about three of them here that I think are particularly important for the success of the project. Uh, I'm going to talk about pattern library integration. How many people have heard of like pattern, li pattern lab? pattern libraries, a lot of people, right? I will introduce it to people, but uh, we got that working really well with Drupal 8. Um, typography, typography was super important for uh, the success of this site. And we use variable fonts as a key part of that. And that's a newer technology, and I'll explain a little bit about what that is and why it was important. And then finally, palettes, palettes, color, the use of color was super important for how we made uh, the design system come to life for Georgia across all of their 85 sites and we really solved some important maintenance problems with the way that we solved that. And then we're going to wrap up just talking about some of the important things that, that were important for us to keep in mind as we built out a really large library of components, how we kept the project on track from the front end perspective, and then we'll just kind of wrap up with some lessons that we learned from this. All right, so pattern libraries in Pattern Lab. That's what we're going to get started with here. So, in just, just to re-familiarize people, um, so this is some information from Anna Devenham. Uh, she's from the UK, has written some awesome things about style guides and pattern li libraries, and recommend her as a resource on this. And so, style guides tend to be more like how does something look, and a pattern library is more how does something actually work. So Pattern Lab is a tool that I've used a lot and I particularly like because it allows you to break down a design into smaller and smaller components of a website, uh, like the logo is part of the branding section of the header and that is part of the larger uh, page of the website and then you can put in different varieties of pages by varying the data uh, for the different patterns on the website. And you can see how everything fits together, and there's some nice interface that lets you change the viewport size without resizing your browser. It's a really great tool to get your website development started. And that's awesome, and I've done it on a lot of projects, 
But one thing that has happened a lot of times is that you get started with that on your project, but over time, particularly as you get to launch on a project, you've got your markup in Pattern Lab, and then, okay, we need to get this working in Drupal, and so you've got some HTML here, and then we've got to get the HTML into our Drupal templates, and so then you have two copies of your HTML, and that doesn't work because keeping it in sync in two different places is just not a viable solution. It's too time consuming. And so what was really important here is that we had one source of truth for the markup for the HTML on our site. And it was really important to be very diligent about making sure that was true and use some newer techniques that you can hear like a lot of the details about that in some other talks that are out there. Uh, I'll give a brief overview, but keeping one source of truth for the markup was really important. Uh, the other thing that pattern libraries can really help with is that a lot of times what will happen on a site is that you get the design started and then there'll be a lot of back-end work that happens and they get all the data ready for the site and then, then when all of that is in place it's like okay front-end developers time to go to work and then why isn't the website ready we really need to launch and you're the last thing in the process and so then there's like a lot of time pressure and so What's really great about a pattern library is that you can just get started with making the markup and the CSS and the JavaScript without having a dependency on the backend work. You can just make your components for the website the way that you want to, and then later on, you can hook them into Drupal. And, and if you have one source of truth for your markup, then you don't have to worry as much about duplicating your work later on. You can maybe have to make some slight tweaks as you figure out how do we make this work with Drupal, but you can try to keep things in, on track. And then finally, another thing that we knew might be a possibility, and now I'm getting into the part where this is becoming a more real possibility, is that we knew that there was the possibility that the front end things for Georgia might need to be used outside of Drupal at some point. And so I wanted to be very diligent about keeping the component markup as separated from Drupal as possible. Keep Drupal templates having Drupal logic and having the, the pattern library components be as free from that as possible. It's not, entirely, it's not entirely possible to keep it totally free, but you can do a lot to keep those separate. And so that was like a principle I tried to have in mind as I was like reviewing code and making sure we were staying on track. So when you boil that down to what are the business needs that the organization had, what was really important, and this was, Georgia told us they had this in when they were asking for people to work on their project, they wanted a pattern library that was important to them, and they wanted it to reflect the real world sites that they had out there. That was an important priority for them. And so we knew that from the start, and we had to come up with a solution. And, uh, and the good thing was I got to be on the project early on in the project to talk about this with them and do some research early on as to what were some of the other solutions out there that, that people had, had worked on and, and was able to take that into account. And then um, the other business need was that we had a timeline for this project and we couldn't wait until all the back end work got done. We had to get started to make sure that we hit our timeline goals. And so getting the pattern library in place uh, early on in the project would let us keep on track. And then I, again, had to keep in mind that down the road, the front end work might be used outside of Drupal. So, Pattern Lab and Drupal 8. What is, this was uh, a project where these two really came together very well for us in a way that exceeded the way that they've worked together in the past for us. So Drupal 8 it has great in that the Twig template language in Drupal 8, uh, it's a great language to, to work with for markup, for one, but it's also Pattern Lab has a version of Pattern Lab that uses Twig. And so you can have the same template language, and that's really nice. And Twig has some tools in it to basically pull one template into another template. So there's embed, include, and extend, and they all have some slight differences. But the whole point is you can pull the contents of one template into another template, and you can feed data from one place to another place. And so we could use that to have our component templates and then pull those into Drupal. That's the bottom line of what we did. 
And, and so, and it works. So we have Pattern Lab here. You can kind of see there's the Pattern Lab interface at the top here for a news story. And, and then we have the same thing in Drupal 8. And it's the same. It's, it's reflecting the real world, uh, Pattern Lab's reflecting the real word, world site that we have going in production. So, um, brief look at how that works. Here's a Drupal template. There's a lot of details in here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that there's an in include statement in the middle there that's calling a specific template, title news.twig. There's some variables in there. And then here's the component template. And this has the title news component. It's the title at the top of the page. And there's some variables in here. And so then on the Pattern Lab side, there are some things that we need to do to get this to match up with Drupal 8 and just how we plan things. Uh, there's this excellent uh, plugin out there for Pattern Lab called Data Transform Plugin that's uh, managed by Alexi Peebles. And what it's really useful is it can help you mirror how Drupal renders uh, markup. So Drupal works with render arrays uh, to turn data uh, and match them up with templates and variables and then turn those into markup, into strings. And so I won't get into the, the gory details of that, but Pattern Lab has to be able to do something sort of similar. And so what with this, we can basically put our data for Pattern Lab into YAML files, which is how it normally works with Pattern Lab. But then what we can do is rather than putting a direct include statement into Twig, we can put an include statement into a YAML file. And that is kind of how Drupal works, where you have a render array that has basically has a string and that's a rendered piece of content. And so we're sort of doing the same thing here with our data structures in Pattern Lab. And it's, it's neat. You've got like the molecules body content here, and we can override that body content with a different body content in this different YAML file for a bio page versus the news page. So there's some pretty cool things we can do in that. And yeah, neat stuff. So, Pattern Lab was really important to the success of the project. It allowed us to stay on track uh, for our timeline, and we stayed in sync even as the project was getting to launch and beyond. We've launched a bunch of sites now. I think it's like 25 sites, something like that. And Pattern Lab is still viable and useful as a way to see what's going on with and test things as we're working on our front end components. All right, next big thing, typography. Typography was also really important, um, and variable fonts was an important part of that. So here's the challenge. There's 85 sites that are out there for Georgia, and it was important for them to really lift up the design quality for Georgia. Design is important. Design connotes uh, the quality of the content that you're having. If you have good design, people are going to trust the site more. They're going to use the site more. Good design is good for websites. And uh, the challenge is there's a lot of different ways that you can make something seem like it's designed well. Photos are one way to do that. But the challenge is when you have 85 different editors for different sites trying to standardize everybody using the same sites of photos and art direction, that's difficult. But typography is something that you can put in place once, and it's going to work on all the components everywhere. And so putting a lot of time into that is, is, is a high value thing that we could get to really get a huge win. Uh, but the challenge was that when you do that, really good typography, you want to have a lot of contrast. You usually want to have a, a lot of different weights of typography as one way to kind of elevate your typography. But the challenge is that the more font weights and font files you add, that can really down, uh, slow down the site. And uh, what Georgia did was, was just uh, brought in uh, Jason Pomental, who is kind of a world-renowned expert on uh, web typography and variable fonts in particular. And Jason helped work with Georgia to systematize their design in general, and also specifically uh, get, get us working with variable fonts and, and do some ways so that we could make the typography very flexible on the site. And then I kind of helped to work to systematize how we implemented that for the project. Challenge, IE11 does not support variable fonts, 
surprise. But the thing is, like, you can work around these things. So uh, I've worked with a lot of different projects to have intelligent ways to do font loading so that things load in an efficient way that is fast and takes into account what happens if this font is not available for this browser. And so you can plan for that. And, and that's what we did. So, and then the other big thing with typography was just that there was a really large number of front-end components that we had to implement. There's a lot of different sites and a lot of different types of content that they had. And we had a limited number of um, amount of time that we had to get this project done. And so one of the things that we did, which I'll talk about how we did it, was we used type as a way to standardize how we would do the implementation of those components. And it, it provided a massive time saving for the front end implementation. So here's the, the things that we solved for Georgia through our front end work is we helped to really boost up the design uh, in a consistent way and still allowed for a very fast site speed. Like overall, these are fast sites for Georgia. And, and we also kept the project on time. That is important. Project managers will like you if you keep, uh, keep your project running on time. All right, so variable fonts. I talked a little bit about them. What are they? So this is the, the font that we worked with, Source Serif Pro. So there's like 12 different variations of this font, but this is like one, I think, oh, I think there's, two, there's two font files here. One uh, for the regular font and one for the italic version of the font. So we're getting a whole bunch of different variations and actually it looks like there's just six variations, but the thing is the variable font is like a vector file. It's like an SVG or an illustrator file in that you can actually have a whole range of like weight options in between those specific options that are in there. It's a super flexible format without loading a whole bunch of different files. And so there's, it's a bigger file than one individual font file, but if you want to have a lot of variety, it's pretty great. Uh, for our sans serif font, we, we did not have a variable font, so we used Proxima Nova, and we just had two font faces for that. And so just to kind of show you what variable fonts can do, Firefox has a really cool tool for this in their dev tools, and you can select a font, and then there's like a font panel, and you could just like mess with a font and like change its weight, like in the browser, it's really fun. And if you wanna go, ooh, like try this. Um, so, uh, so font loading, uh, like I said, we've done this on some of the things. There's a tool out there called Font Face Observer, and I looked at the, the code that we've done on previous projects. Uh, there's some people out there I follow, like Zach Leatherman and Bram, Bramstein, that looked at how they were working with variable fonts to kind of modify what we've done for other things. Uh, use preloading to make sure that the, the page is load, loaded really quickly. Um, but the most important thing was, once we got past that, it was really systematizing how the type worked. Uh, Jason had already started with breaking down that there was different type sizes and there were type styles. So like extra large, large, different sizes, but then those could be associated with a type style that could be used in different situations and different styles could use different, uh, could use multiple styles could use the same size. And so the idea is that each style would have a particular keyword and then as a front end developer, all you have to do is use a, use a SAS mix in to apply this one keyword and you get all this magical capabilities of these type styles that gives you the variations in variable fonts and the, the backup fonts and changes the type responsively and margins and things like that. You get all this magic for how this type style happens and you don't have to go through and inspect every single element in a sketch file to find out how do I style this one thing across multiple comps. You just apply one keyword and it magically happens. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that. So, so here's like some examples of our type styles. Um, different headline sizes. Uh, my favorite are large which is between medium and large, and medium, which is between small and medium. Those are my favorites, personally. You can have yours. Uh, and then, so we define these in SAS with the, uh, the variables for like, here's how it works for the fallback font, and here's how it works 
for if you have the variable font and that's the sizes and then this type styles it got a little bit more complicated we we defined here's how it works for the variable fonts and there's some really interesting things we did that we worked with Jason to do where with a variable font you can say hey here's the minimum size and the minimum weight for this font uh, at a, the smallest breakpoint and then at the largest breakpoint here's the biggest uh, size and weight and in between the browser just figures it out based on the viewport width and there's a lot of fun math to make this work that I helped to kind of systematize into some functions and mixins and things like that and that was super fun um, but uh, that's all great but we still need to make this easy for front-end developers to to actually implement so what we did was we worked with the design team um, Rachel in particular with the Georgia team who just did an amazing job of building out the vast majority of the actual components that we that we built for Georgia and and went into the sketch files to coordinate this so that you could go into a sketch file select a particular element and it would you'd be able to look and see hey here's the type style name headline extra large and so we did that by setting up a type style library of all the different type styles and then Rachel could apply those to the components as she was creating them and then the whole system just worked like as a front-end um, developer you could just go in there find the type style that was applied to the element and then just use that keyword and it the whole thing worked without you having to like inspect every single thing so that was a huge time savings on the project because there's so much time you usually spend like inspecting and measuring things and we just didn't have to do a lot of that on this project which saved like probably hundreds of hours I mean there's setup time on this but there was just a lot of time that we saved by having a really rigorous uh, typography system palettes this is the the third like really big thing that uh, had a big effect on on Georgia's uh, front-end system so so what's a palette so initially the initial kind of design brief um, design system uh, they, they said hey all right what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a certain set of colors and all the sites are going to have some subset of these colors they're gonna mix and match and have different diff different things we call these swatches each each color was a swatch and then we'd have these palettes and here's some Here's a thumbnail you can see here's what this palette is and and look this is what a palette is and and guess what now you're going to color the different components with this and they're going to have a name and so and there was a lot of like tree names and stuff involved in the swatches and the palettes so that's why everything is named like with forest names and stuff in our front end work it's really i really like the forest stuff anyhow um but that's like basically what we had as to how our palette system worked and we didn't really know what it meant so guess what we talked about it we talked about it with the design the designers and like worked it out and and worked out how to systematize this and we came up with a system to make this work um, so colors how do they vary across sites a lot of things times you might see in a Drupal project if you want different color systems for different sites you might use sub themes so Drupal has themes that say hey here's what we're doing with the front-end work you can pick one and then a sub theme can inherit stuff from that theme and then modify stuff but they're usually way too powerful you can change anything in a sub theme and that is like way too much power for anybody to have because ultimately you can do anything in a sub theme and it can get out of control maintenance wise over time things will drift apart and your sub themes will diverge because if you can change something eventually somebody will so we wanted to really put some guardrails on here and guardrails are freedom guardrails are a way to keep things consistent and yet still give people a lot of power so that was really key to letting each site feel like hey we're our own site and we look unique uh, we also used layout builder as a tool to do this uh, layout builder was really key um, to allowing people to select different layouts for different sections of their landing pages and home pages and give it a custom feel but with guardrails so they couldn't go and just do whatever but ultimately um, we had to like solve some problems with that so if we're not going to do sub themes like 
okay, so we want to select, like say put a particular class on the body element for, we're using this palette for this site. Okay, well, when you, when you kind of really think about it, we've got a whole bunch of different components and they use color. And so if we wrote CSS where we varied every usage of color based on a class and like we wrote, like looped through and changed the color in the actual CSS, you would get huge bloated CSS because there would just be so many rules or you'd have to try to figure out writing different CSS files for each component. It would be like total overkill. So what we did instead was we used a modern tool, CSS custom properties, which are also known as CSS variables or CSS vars. And they're basically a, a variable like SAS variables, except they work in the browser. Uh, guess what? They don't work in IE11. Ta-da! <laughs> but there's a way that you can backfill it. There's a JavaScript tool, um, CSS vars pony fill. I'm not gonna explain that right now. Um, and they have some limitations, but it works. They also came and said, hey, we need icons, and they need to vary based on color palettes. They're like little illustrations, and they're SVGs, and we want them to change color based on illustration icons. And I gave Darren, my project manager, a hard look. I was like, give me two hours. And so I worked on this for two hours, and I got it working using the CSS custom properties, and then I demanded to be paid in brisket. <laughs> and at my team retreat, he actually bought me ribs. <laughs> he brought me ribs that he had made himself, and they were amazing. Darren's sit, sitting right there, and he made some really good ribs. So I was, I'm, this is my feature that I love the most because it was tasty. So, uh, so you can see, like, here's an example of how we vary things. There's icons on the left and icons on the right. Same file but they look differently and we're just using a CSS variable. I have to massage the markup a little bit when I get the icon and export it from, S from Sketch, but to put in like a class and some, some CSS at the beginning, but it's this, the same process for every file and it's very manageable. So we saw some really important things here. We gave a ton of power to these sites to look different from each other, but we did so in a manageable way that over time would not let these sites get totally out of control and we also did some neat things like illustration icons that would vary based on color. And we were able to find manageable ways to manage the differences between sites. And, and we used some, some normal ways to do things. We used Drupal theme settings, so, which is basically a config set in a theme. Uh, but we made it useful. We created an input form where we just modified it so people could see that little palette thumbnail. And ultimately, the individual sites are consulting with the Central Georgia team to pick which palette they're using. They're probably not just going here and randomly picking it. But like this helps them to make sure that they're picking the right one when they do it, and not just trying to remember which name is which palette. And then um, we wanted to be able to work that in Pattern Lab as well, and we don't have Drupal settings in Pattern Lab because we want to be able to see what our components look like there. So come, came up with a way to just create a form input and then use some JavaScript to check which input is selected and then set a session variable that could be used on all the Pattern Lab pages and set a class on the HTML based on that session variable. So it was a little work to get that working, but it worked. And that way we can see how the Pattern Lab stuff works um, how the how the palettes work in Pattern Lab, as well. So so ultimately, yeah, we're using the CSS custom properties. They're kind of like variables. You can see this is an example of what they look like in Dev Tools. They look like a variable. It's just they have a dash dash instead of a dollar sign, but they're they're very similar. They have a few quirks, but anyhow, uh, and there's some things that we had to take into consideration with IE11. Uh, the the backfill for it, the CSS vars pony fill, only works if you set the variables at the root level of the document. You can't have any classes or anything ahead of it, so you really have to think that through. And like we had to do some things like export some specific style sheets for each palette for IE11 so that we could handle some unique situations for IE11. And, and, and there were some limitations like Basically, this JavaScript is processing your CSS and replacing the CSS variables with a value. 
And so it takes a little bit to do that. And so the colors don't show up right away. It works, but you know, you can wait for your color I-11. It's okay. You can live. So I mean, I-11 is going to go away at some point. I believe the service ends in 2026, so soon. And, um, and it's okay if it works, but it's not perfect, right? Like it's important for it to work, but if it's not perfect, it's okay. That's an okay choice to make. So, um, so in terms of actually getting this work, we had to do some really interesting things. We had to s define how these swatches and palettes actually worked. Uh, we had to do to get this working in I11. We had to put some of the some of the definitions for things as attrib data attributes in the HTML, which means we had to have Twig read the variable definitions, which means I had to put things into YAML and then have like SAS read the YAML as well as like Twig read the YAML. That was fun. <laughs> so, anyways, those are like SAS maps in YAML. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so there's a whole bunch of swatches and we found it, we needed to make like tints and shades of those swatches so there'd be enough contrast. And so we have like pages where you can go and you can view all the different swatches and how they vary. And then like, here's the key thing. This is the key thing for how this whole system works is that those swatches then get associated in those with those palettes through roles. And that's like just this like made up word that came up with with the process of getting this to work. So like the idea is that each palette has a thing like a dark background and a darker background and a light background and a lighter background. And for each palette, they all have the same roles, but you, ass you assign a swatch, a different swatch, to each of those roles in different palettes. And so then in a component, what you're doing is anytime that you're using color, you are assigning a role, a palette color role, instead of a specific color. So you're not saying, hey, this is a specific color we're using here on this component. We're using a color role. And then SAS is going to do the max magic of turning that into like a variable de declaration. And that way, through the magic of CSS variables, then at runtime, based on that class that's on the HTML, that's gonna magically get translated into an actual hex value for a color at the runtime, rather than getting it compiled out all in advance, which would be a huge amount of CSS. So it was a fair amount of work to get that set up, and there was unique things, like they wanted the link colors to vary based on the palette, some palettes should be blue links and some should be green links. And some, so I don't know, I had to come up with a system to make that work. And then we have to have a system where some background colors, uh, if they're a light background color, then you have to have the text that's on it for accessibility purposes, right? You would want like a dark text on that. But if it's a dark background color, it should be white text. And so you have to like define like text colors and background colors and reverse things out properly. And I had to build a whole system for that. So that was fun. <laughs> when you don't know what background color you have, actually. But anyways, it was exciting. And overall, the end goal is that you don't have a whole ton of sub-themes that are out there that's gonna cause a maintenance nightmare. And that's a really big win because that is the thing that will destroy your design system over time. That is the thing that five years down the road, you no longer have a design system. So this was an investment up front, but it means that this is a system that will last for a long time to come. And, and, and the big thing is, yeah, fallbacks aren't going to be perfect, right, for I-11, but you can do a lot. Um, like I, we, we used CSS Grid on this project a lot, and, and um, one of our team members got like CSS Grid working in the older version of CSS Grid that works for IE11. And like it's not maybe like exactly perfect, but it's super close. And so there's like super cool things you can do for fallbacks and stuff like that. You can use modern technology and you can get it like, you just gotta know that if you're trying for pixel perfect, you're gonna cause yourself a lot of headaches. 
And so if you can talk to your clients and get them to the point where they're like, yeah, I can accept some differences, you'll be a lot better off. But the whole point is that you can make some really good decisions for your clients if you have somebody in the room who understands the browser technologies and the ways the front end development works when those conversations happen. And you don't always know when that conversation is going to happen, like which specific thing is going to be the thing where having some of that knowledge in place is going to help. So it's helpful to have people there because it might have, you might have a solution that you don't know. So yeah, so there was a lot of work to actually just build out all the components, uh, staying on top of all of that work, just building out the library of components was really difficult because we had a really large team. And so like all the things that I just talked to you about, like I had to basically give the talk as we brought on new front end developers and like explain, hey, here's how our system's working and things. And we had a really large team of folks that I want to like thank and credit for all the work because like I helped, I, I thought of myself as like the plumber on this project that was like building like the plumbing for like, like how things worked, but like the actual building of the site was a huge team of people that made the work happen. And they all did amazing work and solved problems and figured things out. Our front end team, not everybody was on the project at exactly the same time. Our front end team was awesome. Our back end team, like, I, I mean, there's a huge team, but Bahaka and Marcos in particular, like, pitched in a lot on, like, helping us solve front end problems. Darren and Don at our Georgia team, like, have been great in helping us move things through. And then, like, Jason helped systematize things. Marissa early on helped coordinate the early design work and Rachel helped like build out all the designs in Georgia. And I'm really afraid that I forgot somebody, but like if I did, and this is recorded, I'm sorry, but like they, they everybody did great work. So, um, but it was hard to stay on top of all that work and like, like it's important to like view and see what's coming in and make sure that there's consistency in the work that all the principles that we I talked about earlier are staying on track. So like one thing I did is that Meg Plunkett was on the project early on, and so I deputized her, and her title was like deputy sheriff on the project. And so Meg was in charge of review, doing the first pass at reviewing PRs, and then telling me, hey, uh, this one's fine, or this one needs your attention for architectural issues. And so that was that was really important for making sure that that things stay on track and, and I could really try to focus on making sure that we were keeping those big picture business issues in mind. I could help people out with challenges and then, um, yeah, sometimes stay on top of like 15 to 20 PRs in a queue and then talk with Darren and as to like, here's what's important for us to get merged this week to stay on track for the project. So uh, to kind of wrap up here, um, yeah, front-end development can solve key business problems. That's, that's the main thing that I want you to take away from this. And that if you can, we had a large project where it was easier to do this. But if you can, I think, I think people think pretty easily about bringing in a back-end developer early on the project. I think it's important to bring in front-end developers early on a project as well. Uh, because we can also help to identify uh, problems and challenges and then plan for those in terms of how things are going to be implemented and identify things early on. Um, we do more than just implementing design. And I don't want to say just, that's a lot of work in and of itself. It is an art form and it's, it's challenging and we do great work with that. But we're also, I think there's few people on a web development team besides front end developers who understand better how web pages actually work in a web browser like what's actually happening with a web browser, how people actually use a web page uh, in, on different devices, with different like accessibility, with different assistive devices. Like front end developers are the experts on like what is actually going on with a web page once it leaves the server. And so we're, we're good people to have around and uh, we can really help to make sure that your website does a great job of being fast, usable, and accessible and that people like working with your website 
so that you don't end up standing in the kitchen and wondering why the fridge door is opening the wrong way, right? So we're friendly, talk to us. Sometimes we tell good jokes, but not always. Just be warned. Uh, if you want to know more about this project, Darren's going to be talking about it tomorrow. Uh, and you should go to the talk because you can learn more about the whole big picture of the project. And um, yeah, I'm Mark. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Drummond, Mark with a C on Drupal.org sometimes, at M Drummond. Uh, be warned, if you look me up on Twitter, I'm talking about diversity and inclusion a lot, as much as I'm talking about Drupal things and front-end development, or you know about how the world's falling apart, which has nothing to do with the content of that slide. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs>
No, so yeah, we didn't go for pixel perfect in IE11, and it was just, I mean, yes, there's a little bit of extra testing for IE11, but it's good to check in multiple browsers, and so uh, it's, it's one extra thing to check, but a lot of times, I mean, IE11 isn't completely terrible. A, a lot of things it gets right. There's usually a few things that are extra challenges in IE11, uh, and if you and that you can know for and plan for what are the things that are going to be a challenge and and just focus on on those and and honestly I mean it really wasn't that bad for i11 it's not ie6 you know i11 is actually mostly good it's just that it's not getting updated anymore and so it's really the things from the last few years that are the problems with i11 all right I am glad to talk to anybody else I'll probably be at the lullabot booth a bunch so feel free to stop by there or you know if you see me i'm glad to chat so thanks all